Hello, AP Bio. Welcome to our video lecture for Chapter 24, Early Life in the Diversification of Prokaryotes. This chapter, as the title implies, is mainly about bacteria, but it's sort of a, a smorgasbord of just of a bunch of really good bio topics put in one chapter. So for this chapter, I picked out a different sort of picture. I thought maybe we should uh, have a picture of some actual AP Bio students. Um, these are four members of the class of 2021. You might recognize them. It's from left to right, Dylan McTighe, Jeffrey Worth, Cole Martin and the infamous Tristan McTighe. Um, this picture is taken in March of 2020, actually at Disney World. Uh, Ms. Schroeder and I took a group of about 23 students to some science programs at Disney. Did you know they had science programs? Because they do. It's called the, the Magic of Disney. And this picture um, is taken at a ride called Dinosaur in Animal Kingdom. And this ride, the, the wait while you're waiting for the ride is almost like a science museum. It has a bunch of exhibits on dinosaurs. We had just done chapter 23, the chapter that we previously did, uh, that included the KT boundary, and they took a selfie of it and texted it to me. I was at a, a different park at the time, which of course makes them the dweebiest kids I've ever met, but you know, it's, it's awesome. Um, and I should also point out that these, these four beasted the AP exam, and they beasted it you know, right after the Disney trip is when the world shut down due to COVID. So you know, about a week after this trip, I didn't see the kids. Um, in person. Actually, I still haven't seen them in person um, because we went virtual the rest of the year, but they beasted the AP exam during the COVID year. So talk to them if you need, if you need some tips on how to survive AP bio during a, a global pandemic. Okay, so this chapter, this isn't a particularly difficult chapter, but there's a lot of very, very important topics. So this slide we've already talked about. This is stuff that's not new. Um, the date for earth forming is about 4.6 billion years ago. The oldest fossils are those those stromatolites, those sort of rock-like looking layered mats of fossilized bacteria, they, they date back, at least the oldest ones, to 3.5 billion years ago. Um, so obviously the first types of life on Earth were, were like modern day prokaryotic cells. Today they take up two, two domains, domain bacteria and domain archaea, which we'll see later in this chapter. And again, the earliest fossilized um, bacteria, this is an, an artist rendering, of these, um, like they look like like stepping stones, but they're flattened mats of bacteria that when they die, they, they fossilize. Okay, so, all right, this is a very important topic. So I'm not sure that we've discussed this. So th there's three parts of what we call modern cell theory. And those three parts are, usually you do this in middle school. Um, the basic unit of life is the cell. The all things that are living are made of at least one cell. And cells only come from pre-existing cells. Those are the three tenets of cell theory, and those are great. But that, you know, cell theory doesn't address where the first cell came from, because the first cell clearly did not come from, from living cells because there weren't living cells. Um, and today, this doesn't happen. Today, you don't form cells from non-living things. So whatever the conditions were like when the first cells formed on early Earth, they were different from conditions today. And you know, no one today has created a cell from non-living soup. No one's done that. Um, but there's a lot of there, there's sort of four a four stepwise theory that sort of it's very interesting into how you could have formed cells from non-living things. Um, the, these four steps. The, the first step is on this slide. You know, it's not a recipe for creating cells, but they're just interesting into how you can create the stuff of non-living or the stuff of life from non-living things. So the Miller-Urey experiment is in the 50s. So they tried to create the conditions of early Earth in a flask. Um, the flask was, it had, there's water, it, it simulated being in the ocean or, or even a, a freshwater lake. Um, the atmosphere of early Earth had water, had hydrogen, CH4 is methane, and H3 is ammonia. Notice, this is the note at the bottom of the slide, there's no oxygen. You don't get lots of oxygen on the earth until you have algae and plants, um, which obviously you don't have algae and plants before you have living cells. They would use electrodes to simulate lightning, and they would let just the flask kind of brew for, for weeks or months. And after about a week, you start getting some very basic organic molecules like amino acids. They just form spontaneously in this flask of, of goo. Um, if you put oxygen in the mix, it doesn't work as well because oxygen is such a strong oxidizing agent that it kind of it kind of prevents the you know it steals all the electrons, so it prevents these reactions from happening. 
Um, another place that you can get biomolecules from is from space. Actually, comets and um, asteroids or, or meteoroids actually can contain um, amino acids that can contain small organic molecules. So is it possible that some of the building blocks from life came from space? Well, they do come from space. We found many amino acids in um, meteorites, meteorite samples from, from Earth, things that have impacted the Earth from space. So the second step in this process, the abiotic synthesis of macromolecules. So I can make amino acids in a, a flask of just goo, um, but how do I turn amino acids into proteins? In the, in the cell, you need dozens of enzymes, you need ribosomes, you need a DNA template. Well, you, you, know, you don't have enzymes on early Earth. Um, an interesting little factoid, so if I take amino acids and put them on a hot surface, like sand, Clay is useful because clay, like clay as in what's in dirt, um, clay can be catalytic. Um, clay can catalyze the reaction of bonding amino acids into um, proteins. Iron and zinc are metals that can also help further the catalysis. So I can form chains of amino acids or monomers into polymers without needing a cell. Now, does this create, you know, life, no, but it just shows that some life processes can happen abiotically. The next step is called the formation of protocells. So obviously to have life, you need to have a way of keeping environments separate. Inside a cell, you know, the, the internal environment is kept separate from the outside due to the cell membrane. So, you know, we can't create cells synthetically, but we can create these things called vesicles, which is a, I'll show you a quick, quick picture. Um, these are vesicles. They're membrane-like structures that you know, keep what's in, in, and what's out, out, and they can form spontaneously. Remember, things that are hydrophobic will just come together if you put them in water, like, like the cell membrane, the phospholipid bilayer, will form spontaneously. Um, so vesicles can create an internal environment that's separate from the outside, and they can, they can split, they can reproduce into new vesicles. Um, here we have some pictures of vesicles. This graph just shows with a special kind of clay, um, the, the vesicles will form spontaneously, especially if you add clay. Um, and the last step would be, so, you know, to have life that reproduces, you have to have a way of, of you had to have a, a program for life. You had to have a way to store information. So how do you get genetic information? Where'd that come from? Well, more likely than not, life first used an RNA code, not a DNA code. It was probably an RNA, you know, universe, in on early earth rna is simpler it's single stranded um, it's simpler to copy dna would be better because it's double stranded it's a more stable molecule plus small rna molecules called ribosomes can actually act as enzymes they're called again they're called ribozymes so rna probably came first and dna came later um, you know not, none of these steps create a cell from non-living stuff but they're all interesting into how you can create the stuff of life without needing life. So this slide's one that you, you, you're gonna wanna pause the video and, and frankly copy this down. So we need to go through the six kingdoms of life. So there's, there's three domains, right? There's domain eukarya, domain bacteria, and domain um, archaea. Within those three kingdoms, or I'm sorry, three domains, there's only six kingdoms. The first kingdom, eubacteria, is in domain bacteria. Um, the characteristics, they're all single cell, they're all prokaryotic, they're the most common bacteria. Cyanobacteria are, are, are also called blue-green bacteria or blue-green algae. Cyanobacteria are bacteria, they're prokaryotic, but they have chloroplasts. So because they don't have a nucleus, you know, they're, they're prokaryotic, but they do contain one organelle, chloroplasts, so they can do photosynthesis. So they're sort of like a, a classification asterisk in the scheme because they have they have one organelle, but they're prokaryotic. Archaebacteria are in kingdom archaea. They're unicellular, prokaryotic. They're bacteria that live in very extreme environments like intense pH, very acidic or hot temperatures. Think like Old Faithful or the bottom of the ocean um, or places where it's, it's super acidic. More about archaebacteria at the end of this chapter. The last four kingdoms are in domain eukarya. Um, Protista, those are protists. Of course, all of these at this point are eukaryotic. 
mostly single cell, although you can have some multi celled algae. Um, there's plant like protists, we call them algae. There's animal like protists, like amoebas or paramecia, we call those protozoa. Plantae or plants, all eukaryotic, all multi cell, there are no single celled plants. A single cell plant like thing would probably be a protist. Autotrophic, meaning they can make their own food, and again, they do photosynthesis. Fungi, all eukaryotic, mostly multicellular, we're talking about things like mushrooms. Heterotrophic, as in they can't make their own food, they have to, they usually are, are decomposers. Um, in a molly or animals, all eukaryotic, all multicellular, heterotrophic, and they have to ingest food. Um, notice there are no single cell animals. So of these six, which contain things that can be single cell? Eubacteria, archaea, protista, um, and some fungi. Um, which ones are multi-celled? Some protists, all plants, most fungi, and all animals. So this classificatory scheme you should be pretty familiar with. Like if the AP exam gave you a description of a cell and said, what kingdom do I put it in? You should, you should know. So the first life on earth were prokaryotic. Um, this is some pretty, pretty simple stuff. So we've already gone through the dates. The most numerous life on earth are prokaryotic cells. They're vital to life on earth because they're the main decomposers on, on earth. So when things die, you know, they decompose and the raw materials go back in the environment to form new life. Um, bacteria do most decomposition on earth. They're smaller than eukaryotic cells. They have no organelles, like, like I said. Uh, most of them have cell walls and their genomes are very, very simplistic. This is a cross-section of a stromatolite, like we said before. The three shapes of bacteria, you have the spherical coxae, the rod-shaped bacilli, and the, the spiral-shaped spirilla. Um, yep, that's great. So th th this is important. So most bacteria, like we say, have a cell wall. They're cell walls. So the cell walls of eukaryotic things, like plants are made of cellulose. The cell walls of eukaryotic cells like a fungus are made of chitin. Remember those back from chapter three? Bacteria cell walls contain um, a polymer called peptidoglycan. It's basically a network of, of sugars and, and proteins together. Peptidoglycan is only found in bacteria. And you might have learned in middle school this test called the Gram stain, or maybe you did this in ninth grade bio. The gram stain is a test used to classify bacteria into either gram positive or gram negative. Gram positive bacteria have lots of peptidoglycan in their cell walls, um, usually harmless. Gram negative bacteria have less peptidoglycan, and those are the ones that are usually toxic. So, you know, back in the day, if you have, uh, if you have gram negative bacteria in, say, a wound, that's really bad. Gram positive is not as bad. Um, with the advent of antibiotics, you know, if you have an infection, they're gonna, you're going to get antibiotics either way if it's bacterial. Um, back in the day, gram negative would be way more serious than, than gram positive. This diagram just shows you, so both these have peptidoglycan and gram positive ones have this thick layer on the outside of the cell, um, of the cell wall that reacts with the gram stain. Gram negative ones have a thin layer between, and they actually have sort of like a double cell membrane. Um, and the peptido or the uh, the gram stain doesn't get to it, so it doesn't. I mean, here look at the picture. The gram positive ones are, are purple. The gram negative ones are this sort of like salmon color. So the way antibiotics mainly work, we discussed this in a previous chapter. Things like penicillin usually target an enzyme that the bacteria has that builds the cell wall, right? You don't make cell walls, so antibiotics there really aren't lots of side effects like. They don't kill your cells. If, if they give you an upset stomach, it's because they're killing the good bacteria in your gut. Um, and I use the word killing. Not all, back, not all antibiotics actually kill bacteria. Antibiotics like penicillin that target the cell wall, they don't kill bacteria. They just prevent a bacteria from building new cell wall, which won't kill it, but it will slow down its growth rate dramatically. Um, which basically will give your, your immune system time to come target the bacteria, um, which is why it's important to take a full dose of, you know, if you're antibiotic you for 10 days or 14 days, you take the full dose because, you know, the first day it, 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 it targets lots of bacteria, 
But the idea is take it for 10 days or two weeks and it stopped growing enough to where your immune system can handle it. If you, if you stop taking the medicine too early, the bacteria could, could come back and actually it could be worse. Um, some bacteria have this polysaccharide or protein layer called a capsule around the cell wall, which is just sort of a, a protective capsule. Um, some bacteria will form these structures called endospores if they're under intense stress, like if there's not enough water. Um, basically, an endospore is like a, a, a resistant bacteria in a, in a very, very sturdy capsule to where if the conditions get better, like if, if you add water to endospores, the bacteria sort of rehydrate and they start to grow and, and divide again. Fimbriae um, are appendages that allow bacteria to stick to surfaces. Um, like the dust in a room, bacteria don't just float in the air, but bacteria could be stuck to dust in the room. Pili, particularly sex pili, are longer than fimbriae, and we'll do this in a minute. They are longer appendages that allow bacteria to switch genes between each other, which is a huge deal. Here we have a picture of, of fimbriae, okay? Um, we mentioned this in an earlier chapter. So bacteria don't have nuclei. Um, they do have a nucleoid region, which is sort of like the center of the bacteria, usually where the chromosome is. So bacteria only have one chromosome, it's a circle. Um, if you look in the picture, it looks kind of like spaghetti. So it's a circular chromosome, but it's highly coiled and folded. Bacteria can also have smaller, very, very small circles of DNA called plasmids. We've probably discussed this in class already. Plasmids might only be a couple thousand bases big. They're very small. In this picture, you can see there's a plasmid, there's a plasmid, and bacteria can swap plasmids between or two other bacteria. One way, remember how we discussed how we made, we engineered bacteria to make human insulin, the story with the, the gene for human insulin. So they took the gene for human insulin, put it into a plasmid, and gave the plasmid to the bacteria for the bacteria to, to make, to express that gene and make human insulin. Okay, so this slide's very important. So genetic recombination, think about if we were talking about eukaryotic cells, and I asked you to just tell me, tell me how animals do genetic, uh, genetic recombination. First, you would talk about sexual reproduction, which bacteria don't do. Then you would talk about meiosis and crossing over, independent assortment, random fertilization. Those are all things that bacteria don't do. Um, however, bacteria can recombine their genes. Bacteria do have three ways of carrying out genetic, uh, genetic recombination. Um, the first way is called transformation. And basically, bacteria, like, if cells die and they're in a lake, the cell decomposes and bits of DNA can just be released into the lake. Some, some textbooks just call it naked DNA because it's DNA not within a cell. Bacteria can take up foreign DNA in a process called transformation, um, which is a form of, of recombination because you're taking DNA from a, from a foreign source. Transduction is the movement of genes between bacteria by viruses or bacteriophages. And this, this slide shows this well. I mentioned this in a previous video, how genes can go between people through, through viruses. So let's say, so here I have a bacteria, it's being infected by this virus. Um, the, the blue wigglies are the, the DNA that will go to make new viruses. But look what happened here. Here, gene A is a gene from the host bacteria. And this virus accidentally got a piece of the host DNA package instead of the viral DNA. So it, as viruses go, it's a worthless virus because it won't cause an infection, but well, it won't cause a viral infection. But will this virus infect another cell? Sure it will. And it could insert the version of gene A here, the A plus gene into another bacteria. And here it could swap out, this bacteria had the A minus version, it swapped out with the A plus version. So basically, is this sexual reproduction? No, because you didn't create new bacteria, but it's like sexual reproduction because you were able to switch genes between different bacteria. Um, that's called transduction. Um, conjugation is the third way that you can transfer genetic material between, between bacteria. Um, this is sometimes nicknamed bacterial sex. It's not sex because it doesn't create new bacteria but it is a way of swapping genes. So basically what bacteria can do is they can create this thing called a sex pilus. 
um, there's a plasmid called the F plasmid that has genes to create this pillus. So say this bacteria had the plasmid to create the pillus, it creates it, attaches to another bacteria, pulls it closer to itself, and then it can give some genes to that bacteria. Um, like I said, the F factor is a piece of DNA, the F plus plasmid, or bacteria that have it are called F plus. So look at this diagram. Here I have the F plus bacteria. Here's the bacteria's chromosome. Right now we don't, don't really care about it. Here it has the plasmid to create the pillus, creates the pillus, attaches to an F minus bacteria, and then makes a copy of the gene for the plasmid or the gene for the pillus in the plasmid and gives it to the, the F minus one. So now it's F positive. So again, it's not sex. You didn't create a new bacteria, but you were able to switch genes. So it is a form of, of recombination. So in, in review, I'll go back a second. In review, there's three ways that bacteria can, can recombine genes. Transformation, sticking up foreign DNA. Transduction, swapping DNA through a, a virus. Conjugation is swapping DNA through a sex pillus. Um, I should also mention R plasmids are plasmids that contain antibiotic resistance and bacteria can swap those also through the sex pillus. So one resistant bacteria could give the resistance to another bacteria. Remember that's horizontal gene transfer, not vertical. Vertical is creating offspring. Horizontal is swapping genes with another, in this case, bacteria. So switching to a different topic, metabolic diversity. This stuff's pretty easy. So if someone asks you, what are the two main things that life needs? If you had to pick two of anything, they need some source of energy and they need some source of carbon. If you can't do those, you're, you know, you're, you're not going to make it. So these four classifications are basically four different, well, they come in pairs of two. These first two are two different ways that bacteria can get energy. And the second two are two ways that bacteria can get carbon. And basically you take one of the first two, one of the second two and pair them up and, and form pairs. So phototrophs get energy from light, think plants. Chemotrophs get energy from chemicals. We'll give an example in a minute. Autotrophs as a carbon source just need carbon dioxide, like a plant. Heterotrophs as a carbon source need organic nutrients like glucose as a carbon source. So which two of these describe plants? Plants are photoautotrophs. They just need sunlight and carbon dioxide. Which two of these describe humans? You are a chemoheterotroph because you need chemicals for energy, like, um, like glucose, and you need chemicals for a carbon source, again, like, like glucose. Bacteria can do all of it, or, you know, one bacteria can't do all of it, but within bacteria as a whole, they can, you have examples of all of these. If the AP exam asks you, give me an example of any kind of metabolic diverse process, some kind of bacteria can probably do it. Um, this chart's from the book. So photoautotrophs, think plants, they just need light and CO2. N notice, like I said, in this chart, where it says types of organisms, all of them say some kind of prokaryotes. Photosynthetic prokaryotes, like cyanobacteria, unique to certain prokaryotes, unique to certain prokaryotes, many prokaryotes. So bacteria is an example of all of these. Photoautotrophs also plants. A chemoautotroph doesn't use sunlight. Um, think of, you know, at the bottom of the ocean, you have those hydrothermal vents that spew out superheated stuff from within Earth. Um, they're hot, they spew out hydrogen sulfide, that compound right there. Chemoautotrophs, which again, are certain, certain kinds of bacteria, don't use light, they use heat or some kind of chemical source, but they can still just use carbon dioxide as the carbon source. Photoheterotrophs are certain weird kinds of bacteria. They can use light, but they can't use CO2. Um, they use organic compounds like glucose. Chemoheterotrophs are things like animals, where you need organic compounds for energy and for your carbon source. Um, notice this says many prokaryotes, um, fungi, animals, some plants like Venus flytrap. But within all four of these, you know, if it says an example of any of these, you could say some bacteria and it would work. Um, quick note on the role of oxygen. If you're obligated to do something, you have to do it. So things that are obligate aerobes have to have oxygen, like my brain cells have to have oxygen. 
facultative anaerobes mean they can do they can use oxygen or they cannot use oxygen so my muscle cells remember muscle cells can do fermentation they can use oxygen or not use oxygen obligate anaerobes are poisoned by oxygen and they had to use fermentation um, these would be some you know exotic bacteria that live in places where there's no oxygen maybe the bottom of the ocean or or something like that all right um, we, we've mentioned nitrogen fixation before. Nitrogen fixation was the deal. We, we did this in a previous chapter. Remember, our atmosphere is like 75% nitrogen. It's N2 gas. All things need nitrogen for DNA or for proteins. You had to have a nitrogen source to survive. But the, the triple bond of N2, our enzymes can't break that. Um, we had to have it in the form of ammonia or the ammonium ion or nitrate or nitrite or, or one of those things. The only life on Earth that converts N2 into nitrogen that we can use is bacteria. So nitrogen are vital to life on Earth because they do nitrogen fixation, which converts atmospheric nitrogen into ammonia or some kind of some form that, that we can use. This, this goes for plants. Plants can't do this. Plants rely upon um, nitrogen fixing bacteria also. So this just shows of my three domains. Domain eukarya contains all eukaryotes. Domain bacteria contains bacteria that are, you know, like, like the bacteria that might live in your intestines, the bacteria we're familiar with are in domain bacteria, domain archaea, and we'll come back to this in a minute, are bacteria, don't worry about the names, they're bacteria that live in more exotic environments. Actually, we'll, we'll do it now. So archaea, and this is interesting, in this cladogram, wouldn't you think that archaea and bacteria are more similar than either of them to eukarya? But this cladogram implies that eukarya, which includes you, and archaea, which are the weird bacteria, have a more common ancestor than archaea due to bacteria. And there's really good reasons why this is. We'll discuss this later. But archaea share more in common with eukarya than they do with, with bacteria, even though we generally call both of these bacteria. Um, when I was in school, there was no archaea. It was all, it was all we, we used the word minera, minerans, where all, just all bacteria clumped together. So archaea, the domain is archaea, the kingdom is archaebacteria, live in exotic environments. Extreme thermophiles like it very hot. Extreme halophiles like it very salty. Methanogens are bacteria that produce methane as a waste product. Um, they might live in the guts of cows. Um, cows produce lots of methane or maybe in swamps. Um, this is one of the hydrothermal vents at the bottom of the ocean. There's, there's light because the, this camera had a light. Normally this would be pitch black. Um, maybe extreme thermophiles or extreme halophiles would live here because it's very hot and very, very salty. Domain bacteria, which again, branched off earlier than, than the ancestor for eukarya and archaea. These are the bacteria we're most familiar with, like E. coli, um, the ones that might make us sick, um, like strep throat, those kinds of bacteria. A word on symbiosis, you did this in like third grade. So symbiosis is just when you have two organisms that live in a very close association. Usually there's a host and a smaller symbiont. Um, three main examples, mutualism would be if they both benefit. So this is the clownfish and the sea anemone. The sea anemone, um, when food falls out of the clownfish's mouth, the sea anemone gets, gets food. The clownfish gets protection because the, the stinging cells of the anemone are they, they don't sting the clownfish, but they will sting predators. Um, the bacteria that live in your intestines, that's mutualism because the bacteria get housing and you, the bacteria break stuff down for you. The nitrogen fixing bacteria that live in plant roots, those nodules, the bacteria get carbohydrates from the plant and the plant gets its nitrogen fixed from the bacteria in the nodules. Commensalism, this is a, a little controversial. Commensalism is when one organism benefits while the other is neither harmed nor helped. Um, an example would be, this picture shows barnacles on a whale. The barnacles um, get to move because the whale moves. So they get basically, you know, these are, these are things that filter feed. So like when the whale is moving, they're feeding. And the whale is neither hurt nor helped. Now, some textbooks, including ours, argue that commensalism doesn't really exist in nature because like if the barnacles were growing on the whale's eye, it would hurt the whale. Um, a vine growing up a tree is an example. The vine, you know, 
adheres to the tree, so it's growing upward closer to the sun. You get more sunlight, and the tree isn't helped or hurt. But a, a, you know, a, a vine can actually kill a tree. Like vines don't like bore into the tree and suck out nutrients, but a vine can weigh a tree down. So commensalism, some folks argue it doesn't really exist. Um, you should know what it is either way. Parasitism would be when, you, when the, the simian is actually a parasite. It harms the host, usually it doesn't kill the host. If the parasite kills the host, the parasite will die too. So think of a tapeworm in your gut. Think of a, a, a flea on a dog. Um, you know, the tapeworm's getting, getting nutrients from the host. So the host is hurt, the, the parasite is, is helped. Easy stuff, but you should be able to give an example of all of it. Um, last thing in the chapter. So the word pathogen, a pathogen just means something that causes disease. So there's a pathogen, the pathogen that, kills mala that carries malaria is a protist. Pathogens could be viruses like um, the flu or COVID-19. Pathogens could be a bacteria like salmonella. Um, these two terms, exotoxins and endotoxins, this is an important distinction. So, and I'm gonna give you an example of each one. So an exotoxin is a toxin that a bacteria might release. And even if you've killed the bacteria, the toxin could still be there. An example would be um, botulism so, or, or, or tetanus. So botulism is, is a toxin we use it for Botox, which whatever, um, is a toxin created by bacteria, oftentimes found on rusty cans. So you have a can, it's rusty, maybe some air gets in the can, and the bacteria, I forget the kind of bacteria, like to grow, because the can's full of nutrients, right? Full of fruit or whatever. And they create a toxin called botulism. Tetanus is another toxin, you know, you get the tetanus from like a rusty nail that's created by a bacteria. Um, both tetanus and botulism, like the bacteria could be long gone, but if the toxin is still there, you're still going to get sick. It's an exotoxin. It's released by the cell. An endotoxin would be a case where this is like salmonella, um, where a part of the bacteria itself is toxic. Salmonella, um, those bacteria have a, a compound in their cell walls that, or is it their cell membranes? Cell wall or cell membrane. Oh, it's in the slide. It's in their cell walls. Look at that. Um, or, or their cell membrane. Look at that. It could be either one. Um, so on a test, say cell membrane or cell wall. Cover both your bases. So like the bacteria could, could die, but like it's part of the bacteria. And when the bacteria die, their cell walls break down. Oh, okay. Here's what it is. The cell wall breaks down. The toxin was part of the cell membrane. There you go. Um, so it, if, if, if there's no bacteria there at all, the toxin's not there. With an, with an exotoxin, the bacteria could be gone and the toxin could still be there. So for exotoxin, think botulism or tetanus. For endotoxin, think salmonella, which is, you know, the, the salmonella, the bacteria have a compound in their bacterial membrane that's toxic. When the salmonella die, they release it, you get sick. Okay, that was a lot of information in one chapter, uh, but we'll call it a day there. Hope that was helpful and I will see you guys next time.